Hey everyone, it's Dr. Marcon. This is chapter six on bones and skeletal tissues. So before we get into bones, we want to talk about cartilage. And we covered cartilage in the first unit of lab. We know that cartilage um, is found throughout the adult body. We can see cartilage in the external ear, and we know the different types of cartilage. Um, so the cartilage found in the external ear is elastic cartilage. We know there's cartilage of the nose, the articular cartilages and the coastal cartilage, um, as well as the cartilages in the larynx and the trachea. And we saw cartilage in the intervertebral discs, the pubic symphysis, and articular discs. So this uh, figure shows you the types of cartilage that we have covered and where they are located in the body. We have three types of cartilages. Uh, we have hyaline cartilage, elastic cartilage, and fibrocartilage. And what's nice about this picture is that it's color-coded so you can see where the different types of cartilage are found throughout the body. And we covered in lab, we have elastic cartilage, in the external ear, the pina, uh, you can't really see the epiglottis, but then we have in blue the hyaline cartilages that we see in the nose, the coastal cartilages, um, the small bronchi in the lungs, as well as the trachea and the larynx, and then we have our fibrocartilages found in the intervertebral discs, as well as the uh, articular cartilages in the joints, uh, specifically in the knees, and the meniscuses, or menisci. So just some general characteristics of cartilage. We have this structure called the perichondrium. The perichondrium surrounds cartilages. It helps resist outward pressure and helps function in growth and repair of cartilage. It consists primarily of water and is a very resilient tissue. It actually has this characteristic where it springs back to its original shape. Now all cartilages share some similar properties. We know that the mature cell type is called the chondrocyte. So anything with this root word chondro uh, is talking about cartilage. So chondrocyte is um, a cartilage cell. In this case, it is the mature cartilage cell. And we know that chondrocytes are located in spaces called lacuna. So they're located within lacuna. Um, we know that because it's a type of connective tissue, it has an extracellular matrix, and we know that the matrix contains fibers as well as the jelly-like ground substance. And we know that the uh, chondroblast is the cell that helps produce the, um, the different types of fibers as well as the ground substance of the extracellular matrix. The first type of hyaline cartilage that we've covered is hyaline cartilage. Hyaline cartilage is the most abundant cartilage. Um, here we see that the chondrocytes sites do appear spherical um, collagen fibers. So the collagen unit fiber is the only type of fiber that is found in the matrix of hyaline cartilage. And we know that the ground substance actually holds a large amount of water, which provides support through flexibility. The second type of cartilage we have is elastic cartilage that contains many elastic fibers. It is because of these fibers that it is able to tolerate repeated bending and we can see elastic cartilage again in the epiglottis as well as the uh, external ear, the peanut of the ear. The third type of cartilage that we covered was fibrocartilage. Fibrocartilage actually resists strong compression and strong tension. Um, it's an intermediate between hyaline and elastic cartilage, and we can see fibrocartilage in the pubic symphysis, again, that cartilage that connects uh, the two hip bones, the oxcoxae anteriorly. We can also find fibrocartilage in the menisci of the knee, as well as the annulus fibrosis in the intervertebral discs. And in lab, we saw histo preparations of the different types of cartilage. We saw hyaline cartilage, which had a ground glass appearance. We can see the chondrocytes in their lacunae. Um, we saw elastic cartilage with those lovely elastic fibers between the chondrocytes in their lacunae. Um, it was very darkly stained. And then we saw fibrocartilage. 
fibrocartilage. The chondrocytes are kind of in rows, um, and you can see these lovely collagen fibers within the matrix. So how does cartilage grow? Um, there are different types of growth within cartilage. You have appositional growth. This is when you have um, the chondroblasts in the surrounding perichondrium that will actually uh, produce new cartilage. And then you have interstitial growth. The chondrocytes within the cartilage will divide and secrete new matrix. Now cartilage stops growing when the adult skeleton stops growing. So moving on to bones. Bones actually contain several types of tissues. They are dominated by, of course, bone connective tissue. Uh, also, they contain nervous tissue as well as blood connective tissue. They contain cartilage in the articular cartilages where um, the bones uh, articulate with one another. They also contain epithelial tissue uh, that lines the blood vessels. So there are different types of tissues that make up bone. Of course, we have functions of bones. Functions of bones include supports. Bones provide a hard framework for the body uh, movement. Skeletal muscles will use the bones as levers. Uh, protection. Bones provide protection of underlying organs. They are also a site for mineral storage. Um, they are a re reservoir for important minerals. Also within bones, we have blood cell formation, hematopoiesis. Um, blood, bone contains red bone marrow, uh, where we have formation of new blood cells. Um, also, bones participate in energy metabolism. We have the osteoblasts that secrete uh, osteocalcin. Osteocalcin is a hormone that stimulates pancreatic secretions that reduce blood sugar levels or um, through insulin. Osteocalcin also influences fat cells, causing them to store less fat and to secrete a hormone that increases the insulin sensitivity of cells. So these results will have clinical implications um, for the treatment of metabolic disorders that are related to blood sugar regulation, such as type 2 diabetes. So talking about bone tissue, um, bone tissue has both organic and inorganic components. The organic components of bone tissue include cells, fibers, and ground substance. The inorganic comp uh, components include mineral salts that do invade the bony matrix. The extracellular matrix of bone has a unique composition. Um, it gives the bone exceptional properties. We know that the extracellular matrix, it, about 35% of it is made up of organic components that help contribute to the flexibility and tensile strength of bone. 65% <clears throat> of the extracellular matrix is made up of inorganic components that help provide um, hardness, exceptional hardness, and help with um, resistance of compressive forces. There, there are cells that make up bone, so there are three types of cells in bone that produce or maintain bone. We have osteogenic cells. Osteogenic cells are basically stem cells that will eventually differentiate into osteoblasts. Um, again, when we see the word blast, think immature cell. However, osteoblasts will actively produce and secrete bone matrix, um, and bone matrix is osteoid. Osteoid is just a fancy term that means bone-like. So the bone matrix that is secreted by the osteoblast is osteoid or bone-like. Um, the third type of cells are the mature cells. These are the osteocytes. These cells help keep the bone matrix healthy. Um, we also have osteoclasts. Osteoclasts are found within bone tissue. Osteoclasts are responsible for resorption of bone, um, meaning the breakdown of bone. Um, we want bone to be broken down in times when we need certain, um, uh, certain molecules 
if we're, for example, low on calcium or phosphorus, osteoclasts actually break down bone to um, give our body a supply of these, um, these minerals, these molecules. Osteoclasts are derived from a line of white blood cells. They secrete hydrochloric acid as well as lysosomal enzymes to help break down um, bone. Now, osteoblasts build up bone, whereas osteoclasts break down bone. And usually these two uh, kind of even each other out because you don't want uh, one more than the other. So if osteoclasts are breaking down bone, we have osteoblasts that help um, build up bone. So we can classify bones according to shape. Um, we have long bones. Long bones are longer than they are wide. Um, these bones have a shaft plus um, ends to the shaft. There are short bones. These are roughly cube shaped. We have flat bones that are thin and flattened and usually curved. And we have irregular bones, basically bones that fall into the other uh, that don't fit into the other categories. So irregular bones are of various shapes and do not fit into these other categories. And here we just see examples of the different classifications of bones. So for example, a long bone that has a shaft plus the two ends. Um, an example of this is the humerus. A short bone, um, an example of this is one of the bones in the uh, foot or ankle. Uh, this is the talus. Um, and then we have flat bones. An example of this is the sternum in the uh, thoracic cage. And then we have irregular bones. Um, that are irregularly shaped. An example of this are the vertebrae within the spinal column. So we wanna go over the gross anatomy of bones. Um, bones um, are made up of compact bone. Um, compact bone is a the dense outer layer of bone, and then they're also made up of spongy or uh, cancellous bone. Um, this is the internal network of bone. We see structures called trabeculae. Trabeculae are these little beams of bone. If you actually um, kind of open up a bone, you can see um, little beams with little spaces inside. So um, open spaces between the trabeculae are filled with bone marrow, and bone marrow is important and has some very important characteristics. So a typical structure of a long bone um, it has these structures, it has the diaphysis. The diaphysis is the long shaft of a bone. We have the epiphysis. These are the ends of a bone. Uh, within a typical long bone, of course, we have blood vessels because bone is very well vascularized. It does need a blood supply. Um, within the bone is the medullary cavity. This is a hollow cavity filled with yellow marrow. And then we have the membranes within a typical long bone. We have the periosteum. The periosteum is a connective tissue membrane that covers the entire outer surface of each bone except on the ends of the epiphyses um, where articular cartilage occurs. Uh, we have perforating collagen fiber bundles called Sharpies fibers. Um, again, these are thick bundles of collagen that will run from the periosteum into the bone matrix. And we have the endosteum. The end osteum um, is the internal bone surface uh, or covering uh, made up of a connective tissue. So here we see the structure of a typical long bone. Um, again, we have this long shaft, which is the diaphysis. We have the two ends. We have the proximal epiphysis and the distal epiphysis. Within the, uh, the bone, we have a medullary cavity, um, and then the outer connective tissue lining is the periosteum, uh, and then we have the internal end osteum that lines the medullary cavity. And then within the uh, medullary cavity, there is yellow bone marrow, uh, and then we can see the two types of uh, bone. We have a compact bone, which is the outer covering, and then we have the um, spongy bone within, uh, made up of these trabeculae or um, beams with spaces. And within the spaces, we have um, yellow marrow, yellow bone marrow. So um, 
short, irregular, and flat bones also have a similar structure. Flat bones, short bones, and irregular bones contain bone marrow, but n don't have a marrow cavity like long bones do. Within these bones, we have structures called uh, diploe. Diploe are the internal spongy bone of flat bones. And here we see that spongy diploe, and then the outer uh, compact bone. Again, we have those uh, structures, the trabeculae, that are like little beams, um, and then spaces within the trabeculae. So bone design and stress, we know that the anatomy of a bone will reflect the stresses uh, that the bone comes in contact with. We know that compression and tension are greatest at the external surfaces. So here we see um, a figure of um, the bone anatomy and bending stress. So we can see that body weight is transmitted through, this is actually the femur, but body weight is transmitted through the head of the femur, which will threaten to bend the bone along this arc. Um, this dotted line right here. So the strongest forces occur at the periphery of this long bone. So we have two types of um, forces. We have compression forces on this uh, loaded side. We can see that um, these forces compress the bone. And then we have tension forces on the opposite surface. So these forces are resisted by the outer compact bone. And then we'll have actually a canceling out. So tension and compression will cancel each other out internally at the point of no stress. As a much as a result, um, much less bone material will be needed internally uh, than superficially. Okay. And this is just a diagram of the stress, the different types of stress trajectories through the proximal femur during loading. And again, these forces uh, will cancel each other out at the point of no stress. And um, compression lines are shown in red, whereas the tension lines are shown in blue. And we can see these lines and we can see, we can pair this uh, figure with the actual uh, picture of the prox the inside of the proximal femur. Uh, where the trabeculae kind of align with uh, these uh, forces, these stress forces. So um, much less material is needed in uh, this area of the bone um, because we know that um, due to the structure of the bone, the compression forces and the tension forces will cancel each other out. So we talked a little bit about bone markings um, the other day. Bone markings are just superficial surfaces of bones that will reflect the stresses on them. There are three broad categories of bone markings that you guys need to know. Um, bone markings provide projections for muscle attachments. Uh, secondly, they, are, they provide surfaces that will form joints. Um, they can also be depressions and openings. So this table, 6.1, is actually a real, really good table that you guys should study because it shows the three categories of bo uh, bone markings and the different bone markings within those categories. Uh, so make sure you know uh, which bone markings are in which categories. So the first um, category uh, for bone markings are projections that are sites of muscle and ligament attachments. So we have structures called tuberosities, Tuberosities are large, rounded projections. Uh, they may be roughened. We have uh, structures called crests. So for example, we have the iliac crest right here. The crest is a narrow ridge of bone that is usually prominent. We have trochanters. And again, trochanters are very large, blunt, irregularly shaped processes that occur only on the femur. So we have the greater trochanter and the lesser trochanter. And then we have a line that kind of connects them. So a line is a narrow ridge of bone that is less prominent than a crest. So for example, the intertrochanteric line we can see is definitely a lot smaller or less prominent than a crest. And this line connects the greater trochanter with the lesser trochanter. But lines are found uh, throughout other, other bones in the body. 
A tubercle is just a small rounded projection or process. We have an epicondyle, which is a raised area on or above a condyle. Um, when we talk about muscles, we'll later talk about the medial epicondyle of the humerus and how all the uh, flexor muscles within the forearm um, attach to the medial epicondyle of the humerus. Um, a spine is just a sharp, slender, often pointed projection, and a process is just any uh, bony prominence. We have bone markings that have surfaces that form joints. For example, on the rib, we have the head. Um, the head is a bony expansion carried on a narrow neck. We also have facets. Facets are smooth, nearly flat articular surfaces um, that articulate with other bones. And then we have a condyle. A condyle is just a rounded articular projection which often articulates with a corresponding fossa of another bone. And this again helps form an articulation with another bone. Um, then we have depressions and openings. Usually these openings or depressions are um, for passage of vessels and nerves. So uh, the first opening we'll talk about is a foramen. Foramen is just a round or oval opening through a bone. The plural for foramen is foramina. We have grooves that are furrows where vessels can also travel along. Then we have fissures. Fissures are narrow slit-like openings. Notches are indentations at the edge of a structure. And then we have other bony markings that fall in this category. We have uh, fossa. These are shallow uh, basin-like depressions in a bone that often serve as an articular surface um, or where you know muscles can, can sit, such as the subscapular fossa. Um, and then we have a meatus. A meatus is just a canal-like passageway. Uh, sinus. Sinus is a cavity within a bone filled with air and lined with mucous membranes. Uh, the sinuses that we'll be talking about are the paranasal sinuses within the skull. So here we see a figure of the microscopic structure of compact bone. This is a section from the diaphysis of a long bone, and uh, we can see the different structures that make up um, the compact bone. So uh, under the histoslides, we saw um, the osteon, which is this rounded um, structure within the bone tissue. Um, and then we saw those lines as well as the osteocytes and the lacunae. We saw those um, thin spidery like lines called canaliculi, which allow for communication between the osteocytes. And we saw these concentric lines within the osteon called lamellae. And then in the middle is the central canal where we have passage of um, nerves as well as blood vessels. And we'll talk more about these structures. So compact bone is um, the structure that makes up the outer part of the bone. Compact bone contains passageways for blood vessels, lymph vessels, and nerves. Within compact bone, we have these rounded structures called osteons. Osteons are also called haversian systems. Osteons are long cylindrical structures that are oriented parallel to the long axis of the bone. Um, and to the main compression stresses. Functionally, they are basically miniature weight-bearing pillars within a uh, compact bone. Osteons function in supports, and structurally they resemble rings of a tree in cross-section. We saw those uh, concentric um, layers within the osteon. So the osteon contains structures called lamellae. Um, each of the tubes within the osteon is uh, a lamellae, which is a layer of bone matrix in which collagen fibers and mineral crystals will align and run in a single direction. Um, and then each layer of lamellae um, alternates directions to kind of help with the twisting forces. So um, osteons also contain uh, a central canal. A uh, central canal runs through the core of each osteon and also is called a haversian canal. It's lined with endosteum, 
uh, and contains its own blood vessels and nerve fibers. But going back to the lamellae, uh, the fibers and crystals of adjacent lamellae always run in opposite directions. This alternating pattern is optimal for helping to withstand torsion or twisting forces. Um, and then we have a centralized uh, central canal. We also have um, perforating canals. Um, perf these perforating canals are known as Volkmann's canals. Uh, these perforating canals will lie at right angles to the central canal and connect the blood and nerve supply uh, of the periosteum to the central canals and marrow cavity. Um, then we have canaliculi, which we talked about. Canaliculi are thin tubes, also known as little canals, that run through the matrix and connect neighboring lacunae to one another um, and to the nearest capillaries, such as those in the central canal. Um, these canaliculi uh, allow for communication between osteocytes and they form gap junctions between osteocytes. So here we see the um, structures within the osteon or Haversian system. We have that central canal that allow for passageway of blood vessels um, and uh, nerves. Then we have the outer lamellae. Again, these lamellae um, are concentric structures that will run parallel. So if uh, the inner lamellae, for example, is going uh, in a clockwise direction, the um, lamellae uh, on top of that will go in a counterclockwise uh, uh, position. So the collagen fibers will run in different directions to help kind of... Um, help with the twisting forces that occur on the bone. So these are the structures that make up compact bone. Spongy bone is less complex than compact bone. We have those beam-like structures called trabeculae that will contain layers of lamellae and osteocytes. Um, however, they, uh, spongy bone and the trabeculae are too small to contain osteons. So you don't have those haversian systems in the spongy bone. And here again, we see those uh, beam-like structures uh, of the trabeculae and then the spaces within the trabeculae. So we have a layer of end osteum. Again, uh, they contain osteoblasts um, that are important for forming new bone and forming matrix. And then we have the mature osteocytes uh, within the solid portions of the trabeculae. So how does bone develop? We have the process of ossification, also known as osteogenesis, which is bone tissue formation. Uh, membrane bones are formed directly from mesenchyme, and they ossify through what's known as intramembranous ossification. So membranous bones form directly from mesenchyme without first being modeled in cartilage. All bones of the skull um, except for a few at the base of the skull, are um, of this category. Um, the clavicles are the only bones formed by intramembranous ossification that are not in the skull. Other bones uh, will develop from a cartilage model, so develop initially from hyaline cartilage, and this is known as endochondral ossification. So all bones from the base of the skull down, except for the clavicles, are endochondral bones, meaning they are first modeled in hyaline cartilage, which is then gradually replaced by bone tissue. So again, this is known as endochondral ossification. So here we see intramembranous ossification um, again, these are the bones of the skull, except for the bones at the base of the skull and the clavicles. Um, so uh, this occurs in the developing fetus. We'll first have ossification centers that will appear in the fibrous connective tissue membrane. Um, so we'll have selected centrally located mesenchymal cells that will eventually cluster and differentiate into osteoblasts and form an ossification center. Okay, so we have our osteoblasts kind of coming together, um, forming this ossification center. So we know that 
osteoblasts secrete bone matrix, which is osteoid, so secreted within the fibrous membrane, which will eventually calcify. Um, so osteoblasts begin to secrete osteoid, um, which is then calcified within a few days. Trapped osteoblasts eventually will mature to become osteocytes. So here we see um, newly calcified bone matrix. So calcification um, basically is just the hardening um, of the matrix to become bone. Then woven bone and periosteum will form. Uh, accumulating osteoid being secreted by the osteoblast is laid down between embryonic blood vessels in a random manner, which will result um, of a network of trabeculite instead of lamellae, uh, and this is called woven bone. Vascularized mesenchyme will condense on the external face of the woven bone and will become that outer periosteum. Again, periosteum being that um, outer connective tissue membrane that will cover the entire outer surface, except for um, any ends that might articulate. So lamellar bone will then replace woven bone just deep to the periosteum, and we have a red marrow that appears. Trabeculate just deep to the periosteum will thicken and will later be replaced with mature lamellar bone forming compact bone plates. Um, spongy bone, also known as diploe, will consist of distinct trabeculae, which will persist internally, and then its vascular tissue becomes red marrow. So then we also have endochondral ossification. This includes all bones basically from um, the base of the skull, um, except for the um, actual bones of the skull and the clavicles. Basically, the, these bones are modeled in hyaline cartilage, so um, are formed from hyaline cartilage. This begins um, forming late in the second month of embryonic development and will continue forming until early adulthood. And here we see uh, the steps of the endochondral ossification of a long bone. So first we have the formation of a bone collar. So the bone collar will form around the diaphysis of the hyaline car uh, cartilage model. Then we have um, the cartilage in the center of the diaphysis will calcify and then develop cavities. Um, here we see areas of deteriorating cartilage matrix. Then we have um, the periosteal bud, which will invade the internal cavities and uh, formation of spongy bone beginning to form. Then um, this occurs about the third month of fetal life. And then at birth, the diaphysis will elongate. So we have elongation of the shaft and a medullary cavity will form as ossification continues. We'll then have secondary ossification centers that will appear in the epiphysis, so the, the different ends of the, um, the long bone. And then the epiphyses will ossify. Uh, when completed, hyaline cartilage remains only in the epiphyseal plates here, as well as the articular cartilages. So we want to talk about the anatomy of the epiphyseal growth areas. In epiphyseal plates of growing bones, cartilage is organized for quick, efficient growth. Uh, cartilage cells will form tall stacks. The chondroblasts at the top of these stacks will divide very quickly. Um, the the uh, epiphyseal plates will push the epiphysis away from the diaphysis. Um, and then we have lengthening of the entire long bone. Older chondrocytes will signal surrounding uh, matrix to calcify, and then uh, older chondrocytes will die and disintegrate, which will leave long trabeculae um, or beams or spicules of calcified cartilage on the diaphysis side. Uh, trabeculae are partly eroded by osteoclasts. Again, these cells that help uh, break down bone, they have the hydrochloric acid and the enzymes that help with breaking down of uh, bone. Osteoblasts will then, uh, then cover trabeculae with bone tissue, so they help with uh, putting down bone or, or uh, forming bone tissue. Trabeculae 
will then finally be eaten away from their tips by osteoclasts. So again, you have this kind of breaking down and building up a bone by the two different cells. So osteoclasts uh, kind of uh, break down bone, whereas osteoblasts, notice there's a B in osteoblasts, build up bone. So here we see um, an organization of the cells um, and cartilage cells within the epiphyseal plate of growing long bone. So we have the uh, resting zone um, within the epiphyseal plate, and then we have the proliferation zone. This is where we have cartilage cells undergoing mitosis or cell division. Um, we have the hypertrophic zone. This is where we have uh, enlargement of the older cartilage cells. And then we have the calcification zone. This is where matrix becomes calcified, uh, cartilage cells will die, and the matrix begins deteriorating. And here we see the ossification zone. Um, ossific ossification zone is where we have a new bone formation. So after birth, um, we have postnatal growth of endochondral bones. So during <clears throat> childhood and adolescence, bones will lengthen entirely by growth of the epiphyseal plates. Cartilage is replaced with bone connective tissue as quickly as it grows, and the epiphyseal plate will maintain a constant thickness, and the whole bone will lengthen. As adolescence draws to an end, Chondroblasts will divide less often. The epiphyseal plates become thinner, uh, cartilage, which means the cartilage will stop growing um, and is replaced by bone tissue. So long bones will stop lengthening when the diaphysis and the epiphysis fuse. Growing bones will widen as they lengthen. Again, we have these cells. The osteoblast will add bone tissue to the external surface of the diaphysis, whereas the osteoclasts will remove bone from the internal surface of the diaphysis. Um, and now we have what's known as appositional growth. Appositional growth is the growth of a bone by addition of bone tissue to its surface. Um, bone growth is regulated through hormones, and we have different hormones. Um, that are included. So we have the growth hormone, which is produced by the uh, pituitary gland, specifically the anterior pituitary gland. Growth hormone will stimulate um, bone growth um, by stimulating the epiphyseal plates. We have thyroid hormone secreted by the thyroid gland that ensures that the skeleton retains proper proportions. And then we have sex hormones such as estrogen and testosterone that promote bone growth. Um, and later on, it will induce closure of these epiphyseal plates. So we know that bone is a dynamic living tissue um, and participates in what's known as bone remodeling. 500 milligrams of calcium may enter or leave the adult skeleton each day. So guys, make sure you are getting enough calcium either in your diet or through supplements. Bone matrix and osteocytes are continually removed and replaced. Uh, Cancellous bone of the skeleton is replaced every three to four years, and compact bone is replaced every 10 years. Bone deposit and removal occurs at the periosteal and endosteal surfaces, so the outer and inner surfaces of the bone. Bone remodeling is done through bone deposition, which again is done by osteoblasts or accomplished by osteoblasts, and then bone reabsorption. Uh, breaking down a bone, which is um, performed by uh, the osteoclasts. So uh, within the uh, spongy bone, for example, we can see remodeling occurring. So we know that the trabeculae of the spongy bone is covered with that inner membrane called uh, the end osteum. Um, and if we kind of zoom in, we can see resorption of the bone matrix um, by osteoclasts that are along that end osteum. Um, and then we have um, deposition of new bone by osteoblasts. Okay, so we have um, osteoclasts and osteoblasts uh, within the bone that either will reabsorb bone by breaking it down 
or um, the osteoblast will deposit new bone, um, all occurring with, along the endosteum. So just talking about the different cells that participate in bone remodeling, we have the osteoclasts, which are our bone degrading cell. It's a giant cell with many nuclei, uh, crawls along bone surfaces, will break down bone tissue through secretion of concentrated hydrochloric acid. Also, there are lysosomal enzymes that help break down bone um, that are released from the osteoclasts. Um, and we know that osteoclasts um, are derived from hematopoietic uh, stem cells. And then finally, these osteoclasts apparently take up collagen and dead osteocytes um, through phagocytosis. So here we see an osteoclast. Um, this is the ruffled border of the osteoclast, which will um, break down um, the um, bone and uh, the bone matrix through release of um, hydrochloric acid as well as uh, lysosomal enzymes. So here is that osteoclast. So how does bone repair itself? Um, we have different types of fractures that can occur in bone. Um, we have simple and compound fractures. Now, a simple fracture is a fracture in which the bone breaks cleanly but does not penetrate the skin, whereas a compound fracture is when uh, broken ends of the bone will protrude through the skin. And we have other types of, um, other common types of fractures that include comminuted fractures, compression fractures, spiral, epiphyseal, depressed, and uh, green stick fractures. And you can see this in uh, table 6.2. Um, and we, we, we treat um, bone fractures through um, reduction, which is the realignment of the broken bone ends. In closed reduction, uh, the bone ends are kind of um, manipulated back into position by the physician, uh, physician's hands. In open reduction, uh, the bone ends will be joined surgically with pins um, or wires. So after the bone is immobilized, or I'm sorry, after the broken bone is reduced, it is immobilized by a cast or traction to help allow for the healing process to begin. And healing takes usually about six to eight weeks for a simple fracture, but it may be longer for large uh, weight-bearing bones and for uh, bones of older people. So here we see the different stages uh, in the healing of a <clears throat> bone fracture. First, we have hematoma formation. Um, so fracture is usually accompanied by hemorrhaging. We have broken blood vessels um, that break in the periosteum and inside the bone that will release uh, clots to form what's known as a hematoma. And we can see the stages of inflammation um, in and around the clot. So here is that hematoma that is formed. Then we have a fibrocartilaginous callus formation. So within a few days, new blood vessels will grow into the clot. Um, the periosteum and the endosteum near the fracture site show a proliferation of bone forming cells, which will then invade the clot and fill it with um, a repair tissue called soft callus. Um, so then we have um, the soft callus being called the fibrocartilaginous callus. Then we'll have a bony callus that forms. So within a week, the trabeculae of new woven bone will begin to form in the callus, mostly through endochondrial ossification. Um, the callus is now called a bony callus or hard callus, and that trabeculae will grow thicker and stronger and become firm in about two months after the injury. Then we have finally bone remodeling that occurs. So if, over a period of many months, the bony callus is remodeled. Uh, excess bony material is removed from both the outer uh, bone shaft and the interior of the medullary cavity. Uh, compact bone is laid down to reconstruct the walls of the shaft. The repaired area will resemble the original unbroken bone region um, because it responds to the same set of mechanical stresses. So these are the stages of healing of a bone fracture. 
And again, table 6.2 shows the common types of fractures, um, which you guys should be aware of. Uh, we have a comminuted fracture where um, bone fragments into three or more pieces and are common in the old elderly uh, whose bones are more brittle. We have compression fractures where the bone is crushed. Um, these are common in porous bones or osteoporotic bones um, that are subjected to extreme trauma as in a fall. So here we can see compression uh, fractures occurring within the vertebrae. We have spiral fractures where um, a ragged break occurs when excessive twisting forces are applied to a bone. Um, these are common in sports fractures. We have epiphyseal fractures where the epiphyseal, uh, epiphysis will separate from the diaphysis along the epiphyseal plates. Occurs where cartilage cells are dying and the calcification of the matrix is occurring. We have depressed fractures where um, the broken bone portion is pressed inward. This is a typical um, type of skull fracture, usually due to trauma. Uh, green strip fractures, this is when the brain uh, bone breaks incompletely, uh, much like how a green twig will break, only one side of the shaft will break and the other side bends. These are usually common in, in children because their bones have uh, more organic matrix and are more flexible than those of adults. So here we can see a break in one side of the bone, um, but the other side has only bent and it's, it's still relatively intact. <clears throat> so then we have disorders of bones. Um, we have a disorder many of you may know about called osteoporosis. And osteoporosis is characterized by low bone mass. Uh, what happens is uh, bone reabsorption by the osteoclast will occur uh, more quickly than bone deposition by the osteoblast. And this often occurs in most women after menopause, usually due to the decreased effects of estrogen after um, a certain age in women. So here we can see um, the trabeculae of normal bone, um, strong trabeculae beams of, of, of spongy bone. And then in osteoporotic bones, we can see these pores kind of infiltrating the uh, trabeculae, making the bones uh, less firm. Um, and this is due to a decrease in the uh, amount of calcium as well as uh, the effects, a decreased effect of estrogen on bone. Osteomalacia uh, occurs in adults. This is basically a vitamin D deficiency in adults. Um, bones are inadequately mineralized. Rickets is just the um, uh, vitamin D deficiency in children. So rickets occurs in children and is analogous to osteomalacia. So basically it's just the vitamin D deficiency in children versus adults. And here we can see the um, pathognomonic bowing of the legs of a child with rickets. And this is again due to a vitamin D deficiency. Osteosarcoma, um, this is a form of bone cancer. Osteosarcoma primarily affects young people between uh, 10 and 25 years old, uh, usually originates in the long bone of the upper or lower limb with 50% uh, of cases arising near the knee. Um, so basically, sarcoma is any cancer arising from a, a connective tissue cell or muscle cell, and we know that osteo means bone. So now we're going to talk about what occurs to the skeleton throughout life. Uh, cartilage grows very quickly in youth. The skeleton shows fewer uh, chondrocytes in the elderly, and basically we can use the bones as a timetable. Um, we have mesoderm that gives rise to embryonic mesenchyme cells. And the mesenchymes will produce membranes and cartilage. Um, membranes and cartilage will ossify. So here we see the primary ossification centers in the skeleton of a 12-year, 12 12-week-old 12 fetus. And we can see, you know, um, the different types of bones that will eventually become adult structures. 
The skeleton grows until about 18 to 21 years old. In children and adolescents, bone formation will exceed the rate of bone reabsorption. In young adults, bone formation and bone reabsorption are in balance with one another. And then in old age, reabsorption will predominate. Um, and we know that as we get older, bone mass declines. Um, that's why now you guys take care of your bones. Make sure you are getting enough calcium and vitamin D, eating good healthy diets, um, as well as getting enough exercise to build strong healthy bones. Okay, and that is the chapter on bones.